Hi, I just wanted to share something with all of you that I found online. Um, John Lamorga recently did a video about Mercury and it was also featured on the Globebusters last week. And I had come across um, this paper here at JSTOR a while back and um, I just thought I'd share this with you because there's some interesting stuff in it. The Charles S. Pierce Simon Newcomb Correspondence. So the first thing I just wanted to read you is on page 411. Um, the sci their scientific reputation brought both men membership in the National Academy of Science. Newcomb in 1869 and Pierce in 1877 where both later became members of the important Academy Committee on Weights and Measures. So both these two men that are corresponding back and forth, uh, Pierce and Newcomb, they were both astronomers and you know both part of the National Academy of Science. So then on page 413, it says, um, So it is remarkable that Pierce could have so clearly anticipated what the judgment of Newcomb's work by the next generation was to be, for his opinion was confirmed a quarter of a century later when Albert Einstein wrote to a daughter of Newcomb, your father's life work is of monumental importance to astronomy. He mentioned especially her father's contributions to the calculus of perturbations. It was noted in the sketch of Simon Newcomb that Newcomb had at times remarked that a new law of nature must be discovered to explain the discrepancy between the calculated and observed positions of Mercury, and that soon afterward the theory of relativity seemed to be this new law. Einstein concluded his letter with the sentence, It was thus that the theory of relativity completed the work of the calculus of perturbations and brought about a full agreement between theory and experiment experience. Without the foreknowledge of the scientific edifice which Newcomb's labors were capable of supporting, Pierce had judged his man fairly and well. So the whole thing about Mercury is what brought about the theory of relativity, basically. So then on page 421, We go on to talk about whether or not space is curved. And um, they talk about here on page 421, they talk about their observations of parallax, negative parallax of the stars. And they were comparing the brightness and the um, So they had negative parallax here, and then they had the brightness. So they were comparing the brightness and the, and the negative parallax of some of the stars to figure out whether or not um, space was curved. And then on page 429, I just wanted to read this real quick. Um, so he says, allow me to remind you that you have known about the following work of mine pertinent to the question. First, that in 1874, I first undertook to weigh the earth by setting up a balance over a deep shaft and comparing the weight of 10 kilos above and below. I did not succeed because I could only work when the machinery you know, so he goes on to explain his experiment that it was, it failed. So this is like another experiment that was tried, I guess, similar to um, Cavendish. And then on page 431, I wanted to read, um, basically, Newcomb and Pierce were in a disagreement because here's a letter from Pierce to Newcomb and so Newcomb was the one that Einstein based his theory on that 
no, Newcomb thought it was that space was curved. That was the only explanation for what was going on with Mercury. Um, so, but Pierce disagreed. So Pierce then writes to Newcomb. Um, So I never cast any slur on the men who do this sort of thing. I said they may, they must have peculiar minds, but in some measure, this is true of any specialist. That you and Hill and other theoretical astronomers find in the afternoon of life that their own successes have rendered their science uninteresting to most people, even to most mathematicians, is distressing. But it is a fact. Meantime. For those who keep on, I, for one, have an especial admiration, and the less interesting from any broad standpoint their work has been rendered, the more they deserve to be applauded, especially since there is ground for hope that something important may eventually come of the work. In short, if you will reread what I said coolly, you will see that I was neither mistaken nor was I wanting in esteem for the theoretical astronomers, and that that which my article contained that was disagreeable was due to my expressing truths that may be unpleasant to a man like you but are truths just the same for all that in short you read into my article a tone which really was not there your position is such that men do not like to tell you to your face that you are wrong i don't like to do it myself though it is not because offending you would inconvenience me Otherwise, otherwise than by sadness. You may be sure that nobody outside your group entertains a greater intelligent admiration for Hill and you than I do. So he's saying, um, you know, he's trying to politely say he's wrong there. Um, so the last letter in this collection emphasizes the psychological as well as the optical factors of which the astronomer must be cognizant when drawing conclusions from telescopic observations. The problem is as old as the telescope itself and became a major issue in the controversies following the work of Lowell and of Schiaparelli on the canals of Mars. So then they, he goes on to talk about psychology of vision and um, whether or not they're you know, putting their own interpretation into what they're seeing versus what is actually there. So he refers to other scientists that talk about um, light and then here's here he says, dear my dear Newcomb, needless to say that I have read your paper on the canals of Mars with great interest. For though I have always thought that granting the reality of what Lowell has observed, it is far from proving the work of intelligent inhabitants. So he's basically saying that, you know, just because he's seeing lines on Mars doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, intelligent people actually made them, or that there's life on Mars. Um... So, let's see, 431, 432 at the bottom. Um, in the present indispensableness of large expenditures for astronomy, we ought to give a little extra praise to be understood as a tactful recognition of the force of character involved in the conquest of needle's eye difficulty to the work of a young man of great wealth who shows a real devotion to the science Beyond that, we should, to the young fellow who is presumably working on an assistant for professorship in some college, we cannot help admiring Lowell's work. He and all should be made to feel that this is bound, that it is bound to advance astronomy and that all science not a little, whether his observations turn out to be observations of the real Mars, whether they turn out to be observations of illusions partly based on instrumental imperfections. In the former case, infusing into human veins a new motive for pursuing astronomical study, 
and in the latter case, enforcing the lessons that percepts are not by any means, as Carl Pearson calls them, the first impressions of the sense, but are results of Schlussverfahrungen of our deeper lying consciousness, closely and in much detail, analogous to the different varieties of critical induction, yet having certain general characteristics of their own, which must be brought to light before we can make the best use of the finer kinds of observations. So this, they're basically, you know, he just thinks that they're seeing optical illusion and interpreting it. So anyway, I just thought you all might be um, interested in that little bit of history and um, the problem of Mercury. I thought it was pretty interesting myself. Thanks.